everyone. Um, my name's Andrew, and as I mentioned earlier, I'm an architect at seek.com.au. So what I wanted to do is come down and speak to you today about the recent iPhone app that we put out. So my time at Seek, I've been there for about three years now, and pretty much been re-architecting most of the core systems. We've been doing some pretty heavy-duty integration, re-architecture projects, integrating um, new systems. Uh, we've re-platformed pretty much the whole website uh, in the time that I've been there. And now we're sort of making this lurch into the mobile space, um, which for me is awesome because I'm actually also uh, working in a game startup with my brother Marcelo. And so we'll put three games out onto the App Store. Um, and the one in the middle there, Your World, is the one that um, we're really sort of um, putting a lot of effort into and we're trying to sort of, you know, get much much broader take up of that app. And um, it's an absolute blast and we're absolutely, you know, enjoying it. So, so it's sort of dovetailing into the work at Seek um, now that we've put out an iPhone app. I've been chipping at the bit for ages to do an iPhone app. So, yeah, it's been a long time coming. So a little bit of background about Seek. Um, I think I'm probably telling you stuff you already know. But Australia's, uh, it's Australia's largest employment website, has been pretty much for um, its entire history. Um, we get millions of users pretty much every day. And so, yeah, you know, in a lot of cases when we're putting out products, um, it, it really makes you think a lot about um, what you're doing. Every little release you do, every little um, sort of update is just going to get pretty much hammered. Um, so, yeah, it's, um, it's been a real blast uh, sort of learning a lot about performance and the infrastructure required just to to serve our users. So yeah, it was about the start of this year that um, the business came to us and pretty much said like we've been holding off for a long time but we really want to do an iPhone up now. And it was interesting because Seek's got this uh, real tendency at a business level to be very focused and almost at annoyingly focused at times. So you might come in with you know lots of ideas and lots of sort of entrepreneurial concepts uh, the business people and the product people at Seek will tend to rein you back in and say we're actually going to focus on the absolute most important thing and nothing else. Um, so they actually said that we just want an iPhone app, we don't even want an iPad app, just an iPhone app and we're not going to focus on any of the other platforms. So that's probably the, the first insight. So um, that had a benefit I guess of letting us really focus um, on technology choices on, on and to match that focus that the business had. Whereas in a lot of contexts, you might have more of a, a generalized mobile strategy, which is, you know, how are we going to get onto all these devices and, and all these platforms? At Seek, um, we were, I guess, fortunate to have a business that knew exactly what they wanted. So where do we end up? We launched in April. So as Sean was saying earlier, it was, a, I think, a reasonably successful project in terms of the time frame. Um, so it was probably in January that we really started, you know, running with uh, the development team. So it was a few months and, and uh, we pretty much worked with an external consultant as well. So we work with Outwear Mobile, so just a bit of a call out to them. It was really good working with them. We were very happy with the relationship. Um, and yeah, internally we were focusing on sort of getting our internal systems into shape so that we could support the load that we were going to see. So there's a few screenshots. I'm not sure how many of you have played with the app, but any feedback is welcome. So yeah, we hit number one in lifestyle. Um, I think we're still at number one in lifestyle at the moment. Um, in the f number of weeks after our release, we had about 400,000 downloads. So um, yeah, we've been getting about 100,000 daily active users, I think, at the moment, and it's climbing. So what that really represents for the Seek business is um, a, re a real transformation in the engagement that we're getting from our users. So. We normally measure in terms of percentage terms the, the increases or decreases in engagement when we release things. When we release the iPhone app, we just blew everything out of the water. So it really was um, quite amazing the effect that it had uh, in terms of our KPIs and the way we measure our, ourselves. So what I wanted to talk about today is just um, a, little, a little bit about the technical question marks that came up for us. And it's always good to share you know, your experience along a journey, and that's pretty much why I'm here. I thought if I discuss some of the challenges that we went through, I'm hoping that will be useful to you guys. Um, and, you know, so the two problems that we really focus on, uh, I think were mainly born out of the fact that we were 
uh, not a savvy sort of app develop mobile app development workshop. So I mean, we we're really great in the web, and we're pretty good. Um, I think our .NET skills are pretty good as well. Um, so the first challenge that we had was, should we build our app using web or native? And I don't know about you guys, but to me, there's an obvious answer. Of course, you're going to use web standards, right? And uh, obviously, that's an answer that would come out of people from Seek. But um, yeah, it was really interesting, the whole sort of struggle that we had in terms of putting down our, our web technologies and, and actually considering that we're going to introduce new languages and new tooling and you know, right through to using different integra continuous integration products and, and the whole raft of things. Everything was going to change if, if, we, if we didn't use the web. So the second major challenge that we had was how do we expose our core services? So this is kind of almost old hat, but I wanted to delve a little bit into this because we did a fair bit of research into uh, sort of building RESTful interfaces and, uh, and, and kind of realized that we didn't really know what true REST was about until we went through this process. And also some of the broader implications about uh, exposing services and how important I think that is to some extent, we found that the, the API was more important than the technical choice we made in, um, in, the, in the mobile UI. So it's kind of probably almost blasphemy to say that around here, but um, it's true. So I'll summarize some of the key lessons before I go into the details. So basically what we found when we were looking at the UI platforms is that native iOS is, is really hard to match for UX polish. Um, but we really believe that uh, staying flexible and embracing web standards and uh, looking at the kind of revolution that we're seeing at the moment in, in web technology is definitely worthwhile. And we ended up actually going with a hybrid app and um, that had a few really, really key benefits for us in terms of how fast we were able to deliver. So I'll touch on those points. And also um, the whole API front and knowing how to leverage and create really well-designed APIs um, we think is just a really, really valuable skill when we were dealing with a lot of, uh, whether it's consultants or people within our teams, what we found is that there was a lot of iOS developers that were really good in the platform and they tended to be uh, fairly focused. I think as a community we're fairly focused on, you know, watching the development of iOS and we're keeping, you know, they, there's this tendency to have to keep learning the new stuff. And when you start sort of throwing out integration problems and, you know, how do we integrate these web technologies, we often found that that really separated the really sort of top flight developers from the ones who were just really kind of mainly focused on iOS. And so I guess just we think it's valuable if you are a developer to, to sort of really embrace the web and embrace uh, you know what's happening in terms of the platforming of many businesses. Um, that was really the big story for us. So I'll delve a little bit into the native versus web problem. So like I said, um, I personally it was, it was an interesting situation for me because I'd come from an IOS background, you know, with the work I was doing with the games and waiting for an opportunity to use it at work. But at the same time, I'd, I'd also become a bit of a web standards fanboy. And what I've realized is that there's just an absolute proliferation of uh, frameworks that's going on at the moment. I don't know how much um, all of you are into the web, but the more I look at uh, JavaScript in particular and CSS and even the HTML5 stuff, the more I just see this just, just proliferation of, of ideas and, and frameworks and tools. And it seems like every time you look back into this space, there's just more options available. So whether it's optimizing for mobile or whether it's trying to communicate uh, using things like WebSockets or even doing server-side programming and building APIs, it's, it's sort of uh, a really interesting time in the web at the moment. So the natural reaction from me was, you know, well, hey, I think we can actually use PhoneGap and some libraries and some really good new web standards. and maybe we can actually mimic a native app. Maybe we can actually build a web app and wrap it in PhoneGap. Um, and this idea was actually very popular at Seek um, when we were lurching into this project. And what was really interesting about it is that I think it really challenged a lot of our assumptions when we started going into uh, what turned into a bit of a shootout uh, between two teams to determine which technology we were going to use. And to overlay that with what the business was saying, so getting back to what I was saying earlier about Seek's focus, 
Um, see, you know, the business and the product team really came at us and just said, you know, it's all about UX polish. You're not going to focus on any other platform. You're just going to do iPhone. And um, we want speed to market because there were some fairly prominent competitors of ours um, already in the App Store. So there was a little bit of nervousness creeping in into the business's sort of view on things. Um, and some of the traditional things that you might talk about with mobile strategy, like things like cross-platform, you know, it's always bandied around and, uh, you, know, you know, the maintenance costs of, of having multiple code bases, uh, the degree of flexibility, for example, that you might get out of web, but they were actually less critical and that really helped us, I think, make a, a good decision. So I was still in a position where I, I was a bit uncertain about the whole thing, so we decided to rustle up a couple of teams. So we decided to do a shootout between the two teams. And on the one side, we had our few of the developers that are actually here tonight, so really good .NET guys, um, cutting their teeth on iOS and um, just really building out a very, very simple app to demonstrate some of the most basic kind of transition effects, um, bounce effects, and, and all of the other things that you get out of the box with iOS. And on the other side, we had these really, really deep and talented um, JavaScript and CSS guys. So guys that tend to contribute to the open source community, um, guys that just know every little nuance within you know, those frameworks to, get, to try and mimic those effects. And personally, at this stage, I was actually thinking that the web was going to win. I thought that we'd be able to get close enough for a business of, of, you know, that, that had the requirements that Seek had um, you know, we didn't, didn't have a lot of imagery and we didn't have a lot of uh, audio or anything sort of out of the ordinary. It was pretty much, you know, just search lists and looking at data. So I thought, you know, surely the web's going to win here. And to my surprise, um, what we actually found is that Native won hands down, um, mostly. And this is in spite of the fact that we were actually using hardware acceleration for certain CSS transitions. So we were really digging into some of the latest changes that are available. Uh, and on that note, I actually think that um, this, this, this shoot-off is going to become a bit of a theme going forward because there's actually a lot more work going on in the space of accelerating uh, transitions in CSS. So Native won um, because pretty much iOS has invested so much effort in optimizing their libraries. Um, that it's actually really, really hard to get that same polish and users really notice this stuff. So you only have to give these two devices to a product manager and they go, that one's the web app and that one's the native app and you're pretty much hosed. Um, so why that led us to is um, the second decision point within this whole context which was hybrid apps and should we go hybrid or should we just go fully native? And what we found is that not only does hybrid enable you to sort of reuse content and widgets that you might also have, but it, it's kind of like a tactical tool. So you, you go into a project and you're doing a native app, and what you find is that there's often assets that you can reuse and things that you can pull out of existing, say, mobile websites, for example. And we actually did that in, in, in our app in a couple of occasions. So if you look at where we ended up putting all of our energy in terms of native and web, the core experience when you're doing a search and then when you're flipping through results was native. And then over here on the web, um, we used it for the job details view. So when you're actually looking at the details of a job, um, there was a few sort of strategic reasons at a, at a product level why we, where we needed to actually keep it as web. So we needed flexibility to deliver the content. In some cases, there's HTML markup that the customers actually put through that actually flows through. So we couldn't actually convert that into native without um, you know, sort of actually breaking things and, and, you know, reducing the functionality that already existed. But the one on the right's an interesting story. Um, we actually, initially, we were sort of talking about this minimum viable product and how we maybe didn't need to do the apply in the very first release. And it, and it came to, to the table late on in the project that we actually needed to do the apply, the, the screen on the right. And so what we did in this case is we actually just reused the apply pages out of our mobile website and integrated it into the, to the native controls. So there's buttons and, and things and flips around that uh, web view on the right hand side um, where it's fully integrated. So it wasn't trivial, it's not like just putting uh, a web view up and then just browsing to an existing site. Um, 
but yeah, it, it was much, much faster than if we had to go to the, the native developers and actually produce this. And we're in a position now where we're probably not even going to go and implement it as native. So that's, in my view, um, that tactical side of things that, that was uh, very, very valuable for our team and, again, contributed to our speed. So, yeah, um, that's just a little bit of an overview of um, what we did in that space. The second problem, now, okay, I'm really in danger of boring the crap out of you now. Um, so this is kind of a bit brave of me to come out and say I'm going to talk about APIs, so please hang in there. Um, and I'll try and, I'll try and be as enthusiastic as I can about this one. So yeah, APIs and exposing services and it's really just something that is close to my heart. And you know, I've been sort of ranting about you know, whether it's service orientation or uh, messaging or, and all of the things that you know, help a business encapsulate its uh, functionality for, for years now, like I've been in the IT industry for 15 years and most, mostly I've been working in these pretty large businesses and trying to build out services. So now that I'm working for a web organisation, there's a, there's a lot less focus on that kind of thing. And I've sort of been championing, you know, let's build services and let's make them restful and all this kind of stuff. Um, but it's interesting how businesses go through this evolution where, you know, at some stage um, they start without services and, and, you know, down the track they end up with all of this technical debt. And they realise they need them, but then it's a horrible mess and it's really hard to, to get there. So what I found is that, um, you know, this is kind of like your classic sort of business starts out, creates a web product or might have a few websites. And what tends to happen here is you start building out your functionality and in a lot of cases it sort of starts blending together with your website code. So all of the business logic is probably sprinkled within those websites and you've got a monolithic database. So lo and behold then, you know, this is I think where we're living in this time where mobile apps are, are the beginning of this cross-channel trend. So what happens is the business says, oh we want to build an iPhone app or, or something else. And it immediately presents a challenge to the business. Um, should you start, how, how are you going to unpick the business logic that are contained in all your existing apps? And how are you going to, you know, let your iPhone app leverage that? And I think, unfortunately, what most businesses do is they take the easy path. They say, well, actually, our iPhone functionality is a lot less than the website, so let's just create a few services over here just for the iPhone app. Uh, and we'll just leave this big ugly website that we've been building up over the, the years, um, we'll just leave it alone. And so what happens is you end up getting uh, two, like a, uh, a duplication of functionality which is just uh, leads to madness. Especially when you consider that we're, we're going cross channel and you know, even if you're focused on Android and, and iOS, you're going to end up with an iPhone app, an iPad app, an Android app, but you've also got your mobile website, your tablet optimized mobile website, and your old school website, your desktop website. And then you might even start creating apps out in you know, the business side of things. So you can see that very quickly you end up in this world where you might end up with 10, 10 to 20 channels that are all hitting uh, and trying to access your core functionality. So I think what's happening and what I'm trying to get at here is that the mobile revolution uh, in, in terms of an enterprise context, what it's doing is it's actually forcing businesses to think about services. So in the past we were trying to create services and sometimes it was hard to justify it, but now we're being forced to create these uh, platforms. Another trend that's happening is you start integrating with other businesses. And lo and behold, that usually requires similar APIs. So remember that the functionality that's required by each of these channels might be slightly different and that's another challenge. How do you create a platform that is, that is actually reusable? And what I see there is this trend towards a less granular interfaces so that you, know, you get more reuse out of them. But it's not, not a simple question at all to answer. So obviously this, this API or this platform that we're building um, sits in between uh, all of your consumers, all of the channels and, and gives consistent, secure, standards-based access into your systems. And in my view, um, this is uh, an incredibly important thing that we need to get right. A lot of businesses are going are to face this challenge. Um, and as mobile developers, I think at times we're at the forefront of, um, you know, we need an API and you actually start uh, giving advice back into businesses saying, you know, 
you know, you've got an API, but do you actually have any existing services that we can reuse? You know, how can we actually leverage existing functionality? So um, I think there was another angle on this, this platform or this API that I wanted to touch on. Um, I don't know if, if any of you have read uh, this article by Steve Yeager. I don't even know if that's how you pronounce, pronounce the name. Um, but I'll give you a, a quick chance to read this comment and I'd just like to get your thoughts on it. So this is, this is actually a pretty big call. You know, this guy's coming out saying that a product is useless without a platform. I mean, that's, that's pretty extreme. And um, the context here is that Steve Yeager worked at Amazon and then moved across to Google and, and he essentially accidentally posted this thing on Google Plus and it just went viral. And I, I must say that this, this rant is possibly one of the best pieces on architecture that I think I've ever read. Like it's seriously a brilliant, brilliant piece and I really encourage you to read it. But essentially he goes down this path um, and he speaks about Jeff Bezos at Amazon and how um, Jeff Bezos made all these mistakes and ruled with an iron fist and, you know, um, but that he did this one thing right that, that accounted for all of the weaknesses that Amazon may have had. And what he did is he, he forced everybody internally to think about uh, the world in terms of services. So if you guys are doing storage, um, wrap a service around the storage functionality. If you guys are doing search, wrap a certain, you know, an API around that. And they essentially mandated that every team um, had to, to talk to every other team through HTTP interfaces. So no one's allowed to talk to a database. No one's allowed to share a DLL from here to here. Everybody had to go through a HTTP service. And to the point where they basically said, if you don't do that, you're going to be fired. And so what ensued in the following years was what sort of basically became AWS and, and, and you know, the whole uh, Amazon Web Services thing. And, and that's pretty much changing the world. And what, what Steve Yeager talks about in his article is that products um, that are user experience based products, um, you know, are only going to be so good. They're only as good as what you can make them. But if you actually create a platform, other people can build products on top of your platform and they can enhance user experience. And so if you take Facebook as an example, so Facebook has a pretty cool website and I don't think they're ever going to strategically say hey someone else can go and build a Facebook website replacement but what they did is they created a, an, an API or a platform in which developers can come in and uh, sort of act, have very deep access into their platform and, and build apps on top of it and now they've got literally hundreds of thousands of app developers um, building apps for them and that's actually one of their, their advantages um, and the examples go on and on and on. So I guess what I'm trying to sort of inspire you to here is that um, there's this whole world out there that's, you know, that you connect to often when you're building an iPhone app um, that I think is significant enough that we need to take notice. We need to, to think about these platforms and we need to think about how any business that we're working with um, should be thinking in terms more of a platform than a um, website or a platform in t instead of a mobile app um, and think about how um, these things are created. So yeah, REST is a technology. This is where um, I think the energy levels in the crowd are probably going downhill and I'm starting to talk about esoteric um, concepts but um, yeah. So uh, um, I wouldn't be pushing this stuff out there if I didn't really think it was pretty important. So I mean REST is one of these terms that I think is widely misunderstood. Um, even amongst architects when I have conversations about REST, sometimes they're, they're completely missing the point. So it really boils down to, I think, using the web as a platform for building networked apps. So when you use REST, so REST isn't a protocol or it isn't a standard as such, REST is an architectural style that, that uh, Roy Fielding put out there um, that if you adhere to uh, means that you're going to take advantage of the essentially the plumbing of the internet. So if, you, if you're talking about the verbs and so on that you use with REST, um, the reason you, you, you sort of you know, bend over backwards to create an interface that is RESTful is that it means that the internet can do its job. 
So, you know, there was a famous comment by uh, Don Box, who was one of the guys who was pushing soap. And, and he was saying that, you know, that GET, HTTP GET, is one of the most underestimated pieces of engineering the world has ever seen. You know, it's, it's just this, you know, the whole internet really is, is, is kind of working efficiently based on this idea that GET can be cached, you know, GET, get requests can be cached throughout the network. And that's very, very powerful. And so when you're talking about building your APIs when you, and, and you, you're introducing REST, really what you're talking about is let's do away with all this kind of heavy enterprise stuff <laughs> and let's actually use something that's modeled basically on the web itself. So just the way uh, your browser works and your, and your internet pages work, that's pretty much how you should be building your APIs. So digging in a little bit deeper, even at further risk of putting you all to sleep, um, what, I, what I found was this Richardson maturity model, and, and I found it just really useful to, to understand where we've been, and, and throughout your development career, you might find that you know, you're starting out building these plain old XML interfaces where you're just passing XML or JSON back and forth, but there's just this single URI that takes everything, and it's essentially just a transport to tunnel uh, code to some mechanism on the service, like an RPC mechanism. And you're really just hijacking HTTP and using it to get the message across. Then when you, you creep down towards level two, I think we hit a level of maturity when we're designing our APIs um, that most people are quite familiar with. So this is where you're trying to use uh, URIs to address <laughs> particular resources. And then you're using these HTTP methods, get, post, put, delete, uh, to express what you want to do with that resource. And that's really where you're leveraging you know, some of the, the, the goodness of the internet. But a lot of people don't get to this next level where we start using hypermedia controls. And you can see that the terminology is becoming even more obtuse. So we're talking about hey TOAS. You know, what, what is hey TOAS? I mean, like, can I ask how many people in the room know what hey TOAS means? It's, uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've spelled it out there, you know, the hypermedia as the engine of application state, and I promise this is, this, I'm not going to go any further than this, but um, really the simple way of putting this is, is just that it's putting links into your resources. And this is really, really profound, because what it means is that your API can be a lot more dynamically driven than just a static set of URLs that you might hard code into your, your app. So when a client comes to you and says, hey, we've got a RESTful API and here's all the URLs, there's these 50 URLs, and you're going to sprinkle them throughout your code. And by the way, the Android team's going to sprinkle all the same URLs through their code, and the web team's going to do the same. And you remember that proliferation of, of um, channels that I was talking about before. Everyone's just sprinkling all these URLs all over the place. The problem is, is that when you start changing your URLs, everything breaks. So what hate Hey, TOAS is about is that just like a web page dynamically delivers anchors and, and elements that tell the, that the browser natively understands what to do with those things, you should be developing APIs that um, pass through links that tell you what uh, available operations are, are valid from a given point in time. So you retrieve state from the server, which might be in order. And with Hotoas, you, you'll have some links in there that tell you, well, actually, you can cancel the order over here. You can actually proceed the order over here, or you can you know, do something else with the order, or maybe you archive the order using this link. Now, the point is, is that those links are not hard-coded into your application. Those, in, those links are actually delivered from the API. And so what we're trying to do at Seek when we're building out these APIs isn't just your classic sort of um, you know, embedding of URLs. We're trying to think within our APIs and, and the RESTful APIs at the level two, we're trying to think about, can we go to level three? Can we actually make it so that our API, um, to some extent, could almost be navigated from a root URI, and you could almost discover the API, so that the application essentially starts becoming a browser of that API. And that's where we really think you're going to get into a position where you can actually upgrade the versions of, of interfaces without sort of impacting uh, all of your clients too greatly. Um, and so I know that was a little bit outside of the whole iOS realm, but I thought it was very worthwhile to share with you guys this sort of uh, learning. So how do you get stuck into doing good APIs? Well, you go and look at some great examples. 
Um, the, the one on the left, top left, I don't know if you guys recognize that one. That's the Facebook, uh, AP, the, the graph, Open Graph API. And yeah, we got a lot of inspiration out of that. And one thing I would say is that when you start talking about API design, you can have the most royal debates about you know, what's restful and what's not restful. And I'd sort of encourage you to think about designing APIs when you get a chance to do that uh, in the same way that a user experience designer might design a mobile app. You design it for the usability of, of the developer. So if developers look at this perfectly restful API and they just don't want to use it because it's just horrible to look at, um, it, you're better off actually designing something that people want to use. So just that's probably the cardinal rule of API design. Make it, make it useful to the developers and make them kind of want to use it. Um, that gets back to the earlier point that I made. If the, if the API is well designed, um, developers will, will tell other developers, hey, don't, don't go and build another thing over here. Use that because that rocks and you should actually use our API. So look at some examples. Um, and these are two great resources that I um, have read. I've read both of these books twice. And, and the one on the left in particular talks a lot about the Hey Toas side of things. So um, I highly recommend buying the book on the left if you're interested. Um, so a little bit of a recap. So two big questions. We had the whole user experience, the UX. Native is king. And uh, just on that point, I think that native is going to continually be uh, a leading kind of user experience framework. I, I, you know, I really think that web's coming a long way. But when you look at what Apple has done at um, WW, as they call it, with IR6, um, I don't think they're taking their foot off the pedal. And there's, no, there's, there's nothing stopping Apple just continually pouring billions of dollars of research into making iOS even better. So although the web is, is moving forward rapidly, and although it sort of feels like it's catching up, well, iOS is going to keep moving forward as, as well. And we don't know what the user experience expectations of users are going to be next year and the year after. So I actually tend to think that native is here to stay. And, but to think that we shouldn't be leveraging the web, um, you know, I think it would be a remiss of us as iOS developers not to be also strong in the web technology. So that's kind of what I'm calling out today, is just try and um, stay abreast of that. Um, and at Seek, we're, we're mad about the web, and we love it, and we're going to always be looking for opportunities to, to do hybrid apps and that kind of thing. Um, and on the API front, even if it's a little bit dry, um, don't limit yourself to any one technology. Don't do what um, all of us old school Microsoft developers did over the years where we're just all Microsoft and there's nothing else. Um, push yourself out of it. You know, push yourself into other areas. Figure out how to build APIs. You know, crack open Node.js and just go and download the library. It'll take you a few seconds and build an API and uh, make it RESTful and use HeyToS. Thanks.